Good afternoon, everybody. At a time of unprecedented spikes in demand following the COVID outbreak, an extreme congestion issue, and acute shortages of equipment, one of the few ways that we can truly increase the capacity of the supply chain in this country to handle more ocean cargo is through better information flow, enhanced data management, and increased transparency. Now, figuring out how to do this in a way that maximizes benefits while minimizes costs is a rather Herculean task. And that is why I am so grateful to my good friend, Commissioner Carl Benzel, for volunteering to take a leading role in this project after I asked him to, and we had a, a great discussion about a month and a half ago. Uh, I'm also glad that several of my colleagues, uh, actually, I think all of my colleagues are participating in today's kickoff meeting. Now, each commissioner is independent and speaks for him or herself, and, and all of us have our own projects to lead. So uh, each commissioner will only be able to attend some of the roundtables that Commissioner Benzel will chair, but all of us will be paying close attention to the meetings and look forward to the findings. Now, this for this inaugural meeting, it is my honor as chair to welcome several esteemed presenters. First, Port Envoy to the Biden-Harris administration, the Honorable John Percari. Now, Mr. Percari, uh, who is also dep uh, former Deputy Secretary of Transportation uh, from the Obama administration, is also a nationally recognized public and private sector infrastructure leader who has delivered on some of America's most challenging products, I'm sorry, projects, and driven the adoption of equitable community surfacing, serving infrastructure policies and projects at local, state, and federal levels. Most recently, he has been involved with helping to convene stakeholders to find innovative ways to reduce congestion at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. He will provide an update on the data initiatives at the Department of Transportation. We will also hear from Dr. Lars Jensen, CEO of Vespucci Maritime. He is a globally recognized expert and thought leader uh, in strategic analysis of the container shipping industry. Dr. Jensen has 20 years of experience in container shipping, the last 10 of which as an independent analyst and co consultant for carriers, shippers, ports, and maritime technology firms. Following Dr. Jensen, Brian Bumpus is Director of Logistics and Transportation for Brentag North America Incorporated, one of the world's largest chemical distributors. Previously, Mr. Bumpus worked in sales with Evergreen Shipping Agency America, covering the Southeast region. And he was recently designated as chair of the Federal Maritime Commission's newly constituted National Shipping Advisory Committee, which has its uh, second meeting later this week. So we are particularly grateful for all the time that he is giving us this week. Finally, we will hear from the FMC's own chief economist and director of uh, the Bureau of Trade Analysis, Dr. Kristen Monaco. Prior to joining the FMC in the spring of 2021, Dr. Monaco served as Associate Commissioner for Compensation and Working Conditions at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where she directed several national data programs. Dr. Monaco is Assisting Commissioner Benzel with this project, I'm sorry, with this project, and today she will discuss the need for data uniformity in ocean shipping. Now, I want to do my part to stay on schedule and be respectful of the hour we have allocated for today's discussion. So I will now turn it over to Commissioner Benzel um, to start the meeting. I will have Commissioner, uh, allow Commissioner Benzel to uh, recognize the other commissioners if they have any remarks. And uh, for my part, um, I will listen intently, but save any potential comments or questions either for future meetings or I'll put them in writing. Uh, so uh, after the session, we can um, we can deal with them and, and that way we'll ensure to have an opportunity to hear from everyone scheduled to speak today. So I want to thank again uh, Commissioner Benzel and everyone for putting this, uh, this uh, roundtable together today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chairman Maffei, for appointing me to this uh, critical project. I, I really uh, believe, uh, as we've spoken before, we need to do more uh, with less, uh, and that means uh, harnessing technology, um, creating a greater efficiency at U.S. ports. I want to thank my fellow commissioners. Uh, we've spoken about these issues many times, uh, and they're working on various projects, and uh, hopefully we can we can meld all these together uh, together to set up a better system at U.S. ports uh, as we move forward. And I want to thank all of the participants. Uh, uh, John, uh, uh, the efforts that you're doing are very critical uh, and, and we need to, 
to move forward with the administration uh, together to work on making the system better. And uh, uh, Brian, uh, uh, Dr. Monaco, and and Lars, who's in actually uh, uh, South America and, and is uh, calling in. So I appreciate their uh, participation in this opening uh, meeting. I'll be brief, um, but I believe we need to get a more accurate portrayal of a common operating uh, picture at operations at our U.S. ports. There are many different segments that have critical roles in the movement of the international intermodal shipping system, and it's it is vitally important in su sustaining our nation's supply chain. We simply have to do better. Our nation's economy will be impacted on whether we can create a better system for the movement of international cargo. And most of our major port gateways reside in large urban cities, where historically the port sustained the growth of the city. Now there is little room for growth. It is clear now that given constraints and growth at our ports, that we will need to do more to be efficient. We will need to do more with less. We will need to have to harness technology and information to create a more efficient system. Going forward, uh, my role is to listen to the industry, to experts, uh, and over the next uh, few months, I'll be working with facilitating this effort, working with our staff, my fellow commissioners, and the industry to, uh, to gain a greater understanding of the current system of maritime information and data. I'll be working with stakeholders across the supply chain to identify data constraints that impede the flow of ocean ca uh, cargo and add to supply chain efficiencies. Uh, speaking uh, yesterday to Commissioner Guy, we were talking about this issue and she said, well, in the end, we, we need information, but we need information that is usable and contributes to efficiency and uh, can make the system better. So we'll be looking at uh, how we can deliver uh, better information uh, to the shipping public. Why is this important? Uh, in many ports, we cannot build our way out of congestion. Failure to better avail the public of existing sources of information to facilitate operational efficiency will either cause costly tra transportation adjustments or in some cases, failure to provide service. I think the public is starting to garner an awareness of the importance of our port and maritime shipping system uh, and, 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 that's, uh, and the importance of that system to the fortunes of our nation. Importers rely on shipping for retail goods. U.S. manufacturers rely on just-in-time uh, 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 shipping to manufacture good goods. Even food products uh, require shipping to produce additives and packaging necessary uh, to sell their food. And exporters rely on supply chain for export sales. It's truly remarkable when you look more at the system, how interconnected it is in terms of uh, getting chemicals that uh, go as an additive for a particular product or automobile tires for an automobile that's manufactured in the United States. And if it's not working together, uh, it impacts the entire economy. What we do know is that as freight moves through our supply chain, information about freight is created, but it's not, uh, it's not often shared effectively. This is sometimes, sometimes caused by lack of constant taxonomy and lexicon and or systems not speaking to each other. Because ownership of, data, of the data changes the, as the freight moves through an incredibly complex system, this lack of efficient maritime data cannot be solved by one party in the chain alone. It will take cooperation and collaboration. It is my goal to structure initial conversations around these issues, identify best practices for naming, storing and transmitting data, and to develop a set of best practices to improve transportation efficiency. In the coming months, myself, the FMC staff, fellow commissioners will be engaging in the follow following steps to move this project forward. Step one, cataloging the status quo in maritime data, storage and access across this, the transportation chain. Two, identifying key gaps in data definitions, classifications. Three, develop recommendations for common data standards and access to policies and protocols. This will, ult, uh, will culminate in the FMC data summit early this spring. And uh, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, starting next week, we will be hosting a series of public informational discussions and briefings with maritime and intermodal transportation stakeholders. 
These informal meetings will focus on different areas of the supply chain and listen to what key players in these areas are experiencing. I invite the public to share their, their needs, their issues, their challenges, and uh, look forward to hearing from them in the future. Uh, but uh, public contribution is going to be critical in uh, coming up with, with what uh, we feel are best practices and moving forward. I continue to hear from many corners, uh, corners that the lack of information and data is creating pinch points in the supply chain system. It has pro previously provided enormous value to the American public and to Amer American exporters, amongst others. The purpose of these conversations is to reveal those pinch points publicly and in doing, in doing so, encouraging the streamlining of essential data sharing. I appreciate uh, Chairman Maffei's support and, and engaging in this uh, 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 critical issue. Look forward to working with the public and, and again would thank our presenters for, uh, for their uh, time today and setting the frame uh, that we need uh, to take the next steps forward uh, to consider this issue. Um, I would like to recognize uh, Commissioner Dai if she wants to uh, present any comments at this time. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Commissioner Bensel. Um, I'm very pleased that you're doing this. Um, since fact finding 27, when we organized the first FMC supply chain innovation teams, we've been talking about the importance of a national port information system to improve the performance of our international ocean supply chain and do what no other country has been able to do, which is to harmonize through information sharing the supply chain. As we had discussed, the, the, the impediments today are not technological. We, we in, in the last few years, since fact finding 27, we've made enormous technological changes and advances. But the one thing that I had discussed with you and that I emphasize is that from talking to some of the best technological supply chain companies in the world, we need to tell people what they need to know when they need to know it. A lot of companies make the, make the mistake of throwing out information to their customers that they developed for their own company's needs. And it doesn't do any good. But if you tell people what they need to know when they need to know it, even if you have to change your own operations, to tell your customers something, the system will harmonize, will stop bumping into each other, and will fly right over these problems. I have, I have some information from, from Fact Finding 27 that I would be delighted to share with you. Thank you for including me. Commissioner Dye, thanks. So we, we spoke again about this uh, yesterday. Uh, this was a recommendation that goes back uh, I believe to the Hanjin uh, bankruptcy and the disruption before caused by the before that. So, uh, so it's not something that has uh, been dreamed up in the aftermath of uh, the pandemic. It's something that we've been looking at for a long time. That's right. Uh, Commissioner Corey, uh, I know you're off site. Uh, uh, do you want to uh, add a comment or uh, suggestion? Well, thank you uh, for. Uh, Pulling all this together, uh, Commissioner, and uh, look forward to hearing uh, what everyone has to say and moving this uh, issue forward. I agree that the data part of it is, uh, is as Commissioner Dye said, this is a critical part of um, our effort. So I don't want to eat up any time on the on the agenda. So look forward to it. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Commissioner. And I know uh, Commissioner Sola is also off site, uh, and I don't know if we've been able to connect with him, but uh, I've been speaking with him about uh, uh, cruise lines and the sort of information that they could be uh, providing to the public. And uh, uh, but I, but I'm uh, unclear whether we we got through to him. So, Lou, are you there? Uh, and do you want to make a, a comment? He can he can't make a, a comment. He's listening in. So. Uh, 
uh, hello uh, to Lou. Uh, and and so so with that, I'll turn to our uh, our participants today. Uh, uh, John Paul Carey, the Port Envoy, uh, uh, your uh, expert in uh, transportation, and and uh, I'm sure it's a uh, a pleasure to be able to to revisit the port uh, system. Uh, ben, and thank you for uh, for your efforts. Uh, and we've spoken uh, many times uh, about the challenges uh, that we're facing in the port system. And we uh, at the FMC pledge to continue to work uh, with the Department of Transportation and the administration to help alleviate these issues in the future. But I'll turn it over to you for for your presentation. Uh, th thank you, Commissioner uh, Bensel and Chairman Maffei. Commissioners, uh, appreciate the time today. And uh, most importantly, I appreciate this initiative and, and what you're doing. It's really crucial. And uh, I'll, I'll be very brief, uh, but uh, I will say that one of the underlying root issues uh, from the first day uh, in this role uh, has been uh, the lack of actionable real-time information. Um, and I'm speaking about the entire goods movement chain. Uh, the maritime component of it is obviously crucial and gets the most attention right now, uh, but the, the goods supply chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and there are, are multiple weak links at this point. So um, I wanted to give you just a brief overview of uh, some of the work that's going on in the executive branch. As an independent agency, uh, your uh, efforts on this are important. I would point out that uh, the Surface Transportation Board as well as another independent agency is also um, facing some of the same uh, information uh, deficits. Um, and what we're trying to do is make sure that uh, that we at the Department of Transportation, the, the efforts underway there do not duplicate uh, any efforts that either the Federal Maritime Commission or Surface Transportation Board or another federal agency might be uh, doing, uh, but in fact supplements it. So um, br briefly, the Maritime Administration at uh, USDOT had been working for some time on port community systems, uh, recognizing that information sharing among the different maritime elements of the goods uh, transport chain are really important. Uh, as you know, there are some port community systems um, up and operational in existence. Uh, our approach has been vendor agnostic, uh, but uh, focused on the da actual data needs. And um, again, I very much appreciate uh, uh, Commissioner Bensel and uh, overall FMC efforts to uh, try to identify some of the data that you are not able to collect or don't have now that, that's needed. Um, and what we're trying to do first is put together an operational picture of the data gaps um, that have been identified by various uh, agencies and departments. And from there, uh, partly through the work that's funded by the ITS Joint Program Office at USDOT, um, uh, start to flush out uh, how that data uh, can be uh, actually collected. Um, I, I think that that uh, if you contrast uh, the surface transportation goods movement chain and its maritime component with uh, aviation, with the airline industry, for example, there's a very different uh, 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 set of circumstances in terms of collection of data where uh, airlines compete fiercely, but at the same time, there's there's transparent data that's available on a daily basis that's actionable and usable, and that's really the goal here. Uh, uh, as you know, in the in the goods movement chain, and in particular in some of the maritime components, there's not a long tradition of sharing data, um, and it's it has been very stovepiped uh, in the past. That's one of the first uh, things that we need to get through. Um, but our intention is to is to jointly um, with uh, FMC and others input um, first build that uh, series of data requirements, what's missing out there, and uh, make sure that a port and other uh, uh, information systems actually accommodate that data. And as uh, Commissioner Dye pointed out, we want to harmonize this so it's usable uh, in a common format nationally uh, to the extent possible and ultimately internationally. But uh, we would settle in the short term uh, for be better data collection uh, uh, nationally that helps the industry, uh, helps US competitiveness, and is a fundamental driver 
uh, for our economic future. So um, that's a, a very brief overview uh, of what we're uh, up to the um, on the DOT side. Uh, Mr. Cordell Schachter, who's the Chief Information Officer at USDOT, has taken the lead uh, in putting together this initial phase, phase zero, uh, as we call it. Um, but moving forward uh, with your continued input and help, uh, we hope to build a more useful common operational picture that, that helps the entire industry. So thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, again, thank you for your efforts coming back to government after a while to step into a boiling quadrant uh, may, may not have been the smartest uh, uh, business plan, but uh, but we do appreciate uh, what you're doing. And uh, 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 next up, we have Lars Jensen. Lars is, uh, uh, I, I did want to go back to one thing. We, we are going to be looking at the full intermodal chain to the extent of our jurisdiction over intermodal movements, because it is critical to look at everything uh, through the chain because sometimes that delay is on shore side activity. So it, it is necessary to look through that. And we'll look uh, forward to also working with the STB uh, as well. Uh, but next up we have Lars. Lars is in uh, South America. And so he's uh, he's told us that he's limited on Skype uh, uh, time availability. He's uh, We've been unable to connect visually, uh, but he's a true expert. I've had the opportunity to I speak at a, a events together with him and uh, he'll give us a picture of some of the macro challenges facing uh, the industry and, and, uh, and the role for technology and, and, uh, and moving forward. Lars? Yeah, thanks a lot. <clears throat> uh, where I want to start this is actually not at the pandemic impact we are looking at right now. I want to broaden it out and then come back partly to the pandemic and the data structures. But one thing we need to realize is this discussion that's ongoing now would have happened anyhow. Uh, that's because the industry, the container shipping industry as a whole has matured. And that means there is a fundamental assumption we have had for decades that no longer holds true. That assumption has been, uh, for good reasons, been that there was always a significant amount of overcapacity, uh, both when it comes to vessels and when it comes to terminals. That was a natural consequence of a rapidly growing market where you needed to expand capacity rapidly to make sure you could cater for tomorrow. That is no longer the case going forward. Growth rates are going to be relatively normal, relatively small. And in that environment, it also means that in the future, the gap between the capacity being used under normal circumstances and the maximum capacity that's available will in general be smaller than what we have been used to which also means we will more frequently get into a situation where therefore a temporary period is not enough capacity. <clears throat> and the fact of the matter is nobody wants to pay for physical resilience in this setup because that is equal to overcapacity, which is exactly what the industry has spent 10 years to try to whittle down because nobody wants to pay for that resilience. That brings us up to the pandemic we have now, uh, the current traffic jam, I think I will call it, that we have in the industry, I don't see that as a result of anything doing, of anyone doing anything wrong. If anything, I see the current problem arise because everything did everything right. But the problem is everyone acts in silos based on information only available to them within their own silos. So carriers would, of course, put in more vessel capacity if their customers ask them to and if they have the vessels available, but that is not necessarily coordinated with whether there is enough terminal capacity. Terminals will handle the vessels, but that's not necessarily coordinated with whether there's enough intermodal capacity behind the terminals to take the boxes out. And the intermodal uh, capacity is not necessarily linked up to whether the warehouses can take the cargo. So I, I see the unfolding over the last two, two years basically as a result of everything doing the right thing seen within their local context because they could not look beyond their own context. And then it comes back to what I said before with the industry changing to have less overcapacity in general. The risk of us running into these situations again is significantly higher than what it has been before. 
uh, a key way to deal with this. That's my view on the market is in terms of data. And that might be me just having an oversimplistic mind. But to me, this is not necessarily rocket science. Uh, if you think it through in its simplest possible terms, think about an importer, let's say in rural Illinois somewhere, placing a production order with a factory in Chongqing within China. He might place that production order. The factory tells him, I'll get that done for you. It'll be ready in a month. Then it'll be a week to get into a container. It'll be two weeks down the Yangtze River. It'll wait in Shanghai for a few days. Then it'll finally get sailed over to the US West Coast, wait on a rail. It'll get railed down to Chicago and then on a truck. And finally, something like three to four months after the production order was placed, the cargo will arrive if all goes well. But that also tells us that if we had access to that information, to that production order the moment it was given, we could predict three, four months out into the future, what would the draw on capacity be through the entire chain? Now, of course, that is not really relevant if we look at that one individual, but if we had that information for all potential production orders, we could also with relatively high certainty predict months in advance whether there would suddenly be a choke point at any given point in the supply chain. And furthermore, this would be actionable information because if this tells us, hang on a second, with all the production orders placed now, we will run out of capacity, for example, to take containers out of LALB in two and a half months, that information could be fed backwards through the chain and say, great, if you want to move your cargo, it might be wise to move it a week earlier, a week later, move it an alternate routing. It will allow us to take action to prevent some of these bottlenecks from arising in the first place, smooth out the supply chain flows. Uh, that will be the way to increase not just resilience of the system, but also increase the utilization of the hard assets. Uh, and again, it requires the coordination, coordination of data all the way through the system, not in the individual silos. Now, there are a couple of challenges in getting down this path, uh, probably too many to list, but there's a few of them I would like to highlight specifically. In order for something like this to gradually appear, one thing that is absolutely critical is that the data are standardized. It requires that the reporting of this information, no matter whether it comes from carriers or terminals or shippers or truckers or forwarders, it all has the same standardized format. There is a significant lack of that in the industry. On the container shipping side specifically, uh, DCSA is the front runner and really doing good work in trying to promote that. More is needed. And on the terminal side, as far as I understand, there is a grouping T4 looking partly at the same thing. But we need that standardization not only to be developed for all the different parts of the supply chain, we also need the actors to actually implement these. And the second thing is in order of implementing it, the other challenge we are faced with in the container shipping supply chain is a very high variation in technological maturity. Let's call it that, where there are clearly some that are quite advanced and there are clearly others that absolutely are not. In order for this to work, we need to make sure that everybody gets up to a much higher level of technological maturity. And the last major stumbling block is it is endemic through the industry that you do not share data. There is an inherent aversion to sharing data outside of individual companies. And this is a major issue because if we want to predict and prevent bottlenecks in the supply chain, we have to share the data because no matter how big or how small a player you are, you only know a small piece of the information. Sure, I might know how many containers I am moving in to a critical choke point uh, a month from now, but I have no idea how much the other guys are moving in. And if we all increase by 10% at the same time, we're going to run into trouble. Uh, and that leads me to the last uh, part I want to highlight here, and this is more a thought than anything else. Because uh, if we think it through in terms of how can you potentially get this information, let's start with the vessels. The vessels we already have information on. We have AIS trackers. We've had them for years. Everybody can get that information. And it has led to applications on the technology side being developed in recent years where AI programs will simply look at where the container vessels are 
and they will make a prediction as to when they will arrive in port. And in some cases, these predictions are even more accurate than what you would get from the container carriers themselves. This prediction, that's actionable intelligence. It allows, in this case, shippers on the receiving side to better plan their logistics, again, optimizing the use of assets. The beauty with the AIS is the competition is who can make best use of this data, not the access to the data. As long as you buy the raw data from one of the satellite providers, anybody can know where the vessels are. Uh, and this is where my overall thought on where the industry eventually is going to end up is this could be extended further to the containers themselves. This is still very, very early days and uh, trackers, especially on dry containers, are at a very rudimentary state. We don't have all that many yet. But if you think it through purely logically, if you had trackers on containers to the same degree that you have on vessels, so you know where is a box and where is it supposed to go, you could do exactly the same thing as you do for the vessels. You would be able to build AI programs to predict all the way down the supply chain where might we have problems coming? What could we do to avoid these problems? How could we redirect it? This again would be a matter of not competing on having the data, but on actually using the data. And of course in this, access to the data is absolutely critical. Uh, the, the final comment I would have on this is for anything like this uh, to work, it doesn't matter how the data is obtained and, and how it is shared, but this essentially has to be global because the supply chain is inherently global. What happens in one part of the world will have significant ripple effects all the way through the, uh, the, the, the whole supply chain. Having a system uh, set up at a national level can alleviate some of the problems, but creating true resilience through the use of data would actually require that this is available at a global scale. And again, that's why I draw on the parallel with, for example, the uh, AIS. So to, to wrap this up, the way I see it is, there is a significant role for technology to play in creating resilience. We can use the assets, be that ships or ports or trucks or rail, they can be used a lot better if we are able to predict what is coming. Conceptually, we already have the information we need the problem is the information is non-standardized, it's not shared, and it's not accessible. So thanks a lot for inviting me here. I don't know whether I'm supposed to take uh, questions now or what the process is. Uh, Lars, if we can keep you on for a little bit, I don't think I think we're going to try to uh, confine ourselves to. Uh, but we, if you if you can stay on and you and you're not dropped off because of telecommunications, we'd appreciate it. Uh, but we'll try not. I'll to stay eat on as long much. as I can. Yep. Okay. Okay, appreciate it. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, um, and uh, next we have uh, Brian Bumpus, who's the head of our uh, Shippers Advisory uh, Committee. And I, I think this is a good opportunity for uh, you in that, that capacity to, uh, uh, to make your first public statement uh, uh, at, a, at a, a meeting like this. So uh, look forward to your uh, comments. Thank you, Carl, and um, thank you uh, to uh, Chairman Maffei and the other commissioners. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I do share, serve on the NA, uh, NSAC, um, but today I'm going to speak uh, primarily as a shipper. So, uh, you know, the views that uh, I'll communicate today don't necessarily reflect those of the uh, committee uh, or of the FMC, certainly, uh, or any of the government agency. Um, that being said, if it's OK, I'd like to actually share some content that, uh, you know, I, I pre-prepared here. Give me just a second to yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this brief. Um, generally, I talk pretty fast, so we should be able to get through this uh, relatively quickly. But I wanted to highlight just some very simple uh, real-time data gaps that plague shippers, both on the import and the export side. Um, you know, certainly some of these are more noticeable now. Um, on the heels of the pandemic prior to you know, 2020, 2021. Um, not having real-time visibility of where carrier capacity outlooks are or what we call load factors on the import side and the export side makes proactive planning for shippers very difficult. Um, if we have uh, a group of carriers that we have contracts with and we have a primary, secondary, tertiary, so on and so forth, if a primary 
constraint it makes it a lot easier for us ahead of time. By ahead of time, we, um, that allows us to cascade down our routing guide consequentially and keep our supply chain on schedule. Similarly, with equipment availability, I mean, certainly during the pandemic, we noticed that there were equipment bottlenecks in many places that were important ports of load, whether in the US or certainly abroad, primarily in North and Central China. Um, you know, lack of visibility to equipment availability also plagued our ability to plan and, and keep our supply chains uh, and cost effective. Um, there seems to be quite a few cargo um, status disagreements between tracking data uh, provided by carriers and also those provided by terminals. Unfortunately, as we specifically, we've seen the quality of data from carriers traffically degraded over time. Um, we'll see uh, cargo notifications that say that the uh, the vessel has berth when in fact it's still anchored in Long Beach Harbor per data from Cargo Insights and, and other platforms. Um, when carriers say that the cargo has been discharged, the terminal may say, yes, we have it, but it's not released. Um, this certainly leads to the fifth bullet point here where we have a last three day disagreement where the carrier says the cargo has been discharged. They, sh they start to demerge a free time clock, but the cargo isn't available for importers to go and actually retrieve. So we're almost uh, predetermined to, to be uh, you know, paying to merge on those. Um, gate congestion at the terminal level is something that we also kind of struggled to gain the circles in the JOC and other trade publications that have kind of a, a macro description of congestion, whether that be at the Los Angeles macro ter terminal complex or in Savannah or New York necessarily give the full picture problem in Florida with the three terminals they have at Port of Miami system. Earliest return date information um, for the export side uh, is in many cases frustrating as earliest return dates can change last minute with no notification prior, uh, even when cargo is already in transit on the truck. Earliest return dates will shift, they'll get delayed a couple of days, which uh, certainly adds new wrinkles that were unforeseen to uh, individual supply chains for shippers and also cost exposure, whether that be a truck order not used, uh, truck or storage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, vessel schedule delays and updates are generally communicated at the 11th hour. Um, I don't know any shipper of any size or consequence that is agile enough to move their supply chain within a matter of hours. Um, and certainly if containers have already been loaded and a vessel is delayed or it's skipping a port of load, we can't just take that cargo out of a container, move it on another carrier to keep the supply chain on schedule. Um, there's been you know, re requests through the shipper industry to have uh, poor productivity or performance metrics that are released in the platform side are better to use, irrespective of cost. Um, and certainly not having visibility to changing and dynamic spot rates uh, where you know capacity constraints push cargo off of service contracts and into the spot market makes planning difficult uh, for shippers as well uh, as we create quotes uh, to Lars point three four months uh, prior to actually taking delivery and, and closing commerce on the import side. Um, there we go. There's a lack of standardization as well, which is somewhat troubling. Um, there's been many reports again through the shipper community of demerged attention being entered terms between carriers. Some carriers will pronounce store merge, others refer to it as detention. In some cases, they'll get the with both terms from the same carrier on different ship. Um, inconsistently as well. Some carry well other tension and then port storage. Um, that last requires the shipper or their um, uh, them to not be vendor to clear the cargo, but actually pay to one charge is paid to the terminal, one charge is paid to the carrier. Um, certainly terminals operating on different platforms is a reality that I think is unavoidable, at least in the short term. Uh, but this adds another uh, intricacy to uh, a shipper's perspective of, of supply chain and logistics efficiency. And finally, not all parties involved with the shipment have approved access to even clear to merge and, and take uh, possession of cargo. Um, you know, the company that I work for, Brentag, for example, uh, utilizes a, a large truck broker for a drayage in many of our ports of discharge. Uh, that truck broker is not allowed to actually clear to merge on our behalf. And so we either have to scramble and have a regional operating companies try to clear that, which generally results in an additional day of demerge, or our customs broker will pay that for us with a nominal fee on top for the cash outlet. 
Um, not all of these are super inconvenient, but they do add additional cost. There's not a lot of rhyme or reason as to why uh, a broker in this case uh, would not have access to clear to merge. With these gaps unresolved, um, it makes it very difficult for shippers to be proactive um, in, in planning our supply chain, not just in the short term, but primarily in the long term, which is our, our, our focus. We want to plan as far out in advance as possible. Um, most shippers will utilize a transportation management platform uh, to help aggregate all of the different pieces of information coming in from all parties involved in our global trade. Um, however, that's just aggregating information. It's not actually creating or verifying information, which leads then to the garbage in, garbage out um, sort of motto. Uh, I'd like to give a couple of real examples here. And Carl, I'm gonna minimize your, your face down here so we can see. Um, a couple of real examples of data changing last minute, one on the export side and one on the import side. Um, in this example, um, an ERD was provided by the carrier to, to an exporter. The exporter dispatched their drayage provider to pick up that container and deliver it by the earliest return date. The earliest return date, however, was changed as the truck was in transit. Cargo could not gate in, carrier refused that cargo, and the shipper absorbed the additional costs. What's more troubling here is that this was a carrier door move. So the carrier's trucker was actually responsible for, for pulling that load. The shipper had no control over which truck was dispatched. They had no control over the designation of the earliest return date initially. They certainly had no control uh, over the change to the earliest return date, uh, and yet they bore the cost in the end. Potential resolution to this would have, uh, you know, terminals, whether or not they would agree, that's maybe something that, that Mr. Picari could offer some insight into. But on the shipper side, we have cargo cutoff dates. We have documentation cutoff dates. It would be great if terminals would also have some sort of similar deadline um, that would be a drop dead date after which updates were either disallowed or if updates were required, shippers could still maintain action against the original dates without any sort of cost exposure. Similarly, on the import side, this is a very uh, similar example, and this is actually one that uh, me and my team experienced just a couple of weeks ago. But the carrier tracking data showed that the cargo had discharged in Los Angeles, and the last free day was defined. The terminal system, however, showed that the cargo was not available for pickup. In fact, the cargo stayed unavailable for nine days. Um, during that time, obviously, the last free day expired. Um, we were unable to go pick up that car. We had to merge exposure at five days. On carrier invoice system merge almost immediately, we had to clear that demerge before actually successfully pulling that container off terminal. Um, and then, of course, we go into a demerge dispute process with the carrier to see if we can recuperate that. The hard part is, is that not all shippers either have the bandwidth or the foresight to take screenshots of port systems showing the unavailable, uh, inavailability of cargo uh, or keep a record of all of the communications related. So getting dispute resolution at, that's, that's preferential to shippers in many cases is almost impossible. Uh, and that's even provided the carriers actually you know, pick up the phone uh, or respond to emails related to the topic. A verification protocol uh, between the carrier and the terminal would be a great help. Um, TradeLens, uh, the blockchain platform was developed uh, jointly by, um, by Maersk and by IBM, uh, and I think uh, is currently linked with uh, Los Angeles' support optimizer platform is an example of a great blockchain solution that could offer uh, some help in this regard. However, not all parties have access to trade lines. For example, customs brokers uh, don't have a platform that they could actually purchase from trades lines. Uh, trade lines is also a for-profit product, which puts the burden again of cost onto the shipper to resolve information and data by unaffiliated parties to them. So, some thoughts on what we need in the future. Certainly standardization uh, would be a, a great first step. We need to standardize uh, and harmonize shipping vocabulary. Demerge, detention, per diem, these terms need to be standard uh, across all parties involved in, in logistics transactions. Uh, cutoff dates and earliest return dates in the last three days uh, for import or exports and imports respectively between alliance partners and terminals would be another great help. Um, in some cases, we'll have you know, three carriers uh, sharing a vessel on an alliance, but they'll all have different cutoff dates for either the cargo uh, or uh, documentation, which doesn't really make sense as the plane is, or the, in this case, I'm sorry, the ship is leaving at the same time. I say plane because we don't have the same issue with airlines. You know, if we have a United flight out of Houston, but Turkish Airlines is, uh, has some seats on there and can issue tickets against that flight, all the data is the same. The boarding time is the same. The takeoff time is the same. The tracking information of the plane and flight is the same. That doesn't necessarily translate to the ocean world. Similarly, with uh, cargo on, in this example of, uh, of, of an alliance vessel with three carriers on that vessel, 
the tracking data uh, for those three carriers won't jive. In many cases, uh, Brintag has cargo with you know, all three carriers in the Ocean Alliance on the same vessel. Um, and yet the, the arrival information uh, is, has disparagement between all three parties on the tracking systems online, which really makes no sense uh, whatsoever. Um, last three day agreement between carriers and terminals. Uh, this uh, bullet point refers to uh, my prior example of uh, should, the merge, should the demerge clock start while the cargo is still unavailable for pickup by terminal systems. Um, standardize, standardizing terminal platforms is a great uh, idea as well, but like I mentioned before, I don't think that this is really feasible um, in the short mid or maybe even long term. And then chassis usage. Um, in just a moment, we'll talk about box rules, but um, you know, having standardized chassis uh, programs, which may or may not require the elimination of box rules, would be a great help, not just to shippers, uh, but I think also to the port infrastructure. And I know that a lot of the delays currently in Los Angeles long range are consequential to not having enough chassis in the market. There actually are no chassis. They just use interchangeably between carriers consequential to box uh, rules. Um, here, not eating those last minute on shippers. Having uh, requirements for data integrity and timeliness. Um, you know, shippers should not be told, uh, you know, four days later that the vessel uh, has been delayed. If the vessel uh, is or if the I'm sorry if the carrier the cargo has arrived and four days later we get another update that says the cargo has not arrived uh, this quite candidly is, is just not acceptable gate appointments uh, and I, I put in parentheses here flex with congestion um, when there is congestion at the gates at, at ports what we know, often see is truckers sitting in line for three four five sometimes more hours um, even if they get to the port early uh, they may still get to the actual will get 15, 20 minutes after the fact or after their appointment. Um, you know, for, for, for Brentag, we've seen a number of cases where a trucker has been turned away for being 10 minutes late to the gate when they've sat in line for six or seven hours prior. Um, not all shippers have contacts with the ports that we can just, you know, call and, and get a, an, an ad hoc real-time resolution to delays like this. And finally, empty return access. Um, you know, this is a a little bit of a more difficult problem to solve because obviously shippers are are are, are conscious of uh, the port and terminals real estate constraints. There's too many full containers on the terminal; it makes it difficult to return empties. Um, you know, however, we need to have some sort of guideline uh, or map that's a little bit more structured than it currently is to get an idea of when we might be able to return empties, which will free up chassis um, and get our supply chains back on schedule if we have limited access to drainage capacity. Uh, from a technology standpoint in the future, um, you know, shippers would love to see uh, you know, more uh, adoption of blockchain platforms provided that there is uh, equivalent access um, to all parties. Two-way API feeds linking uh, shippers, TMS, warehouse management, or ERP platforms of carriers and terminals is um, a little bit reflective of, of, one of something that Lars said a moment ago, which I, I fully agree with. Uh, visibility of import orders, for example, at the time those orders are placed with overseas suppliers at the macro level would dramatically help all parties involved. It would help ports plan effectively for incoming cargo. It would help carriers manage both equipment uh, and capacity. And more importantly, it would help carriers proactively act as a partner and communicate probable delays to shippers well in advance to say, hey, you know, based on what we've already seen being booked by our uh, or being uh, ordered from our overseas suppliers by our contract clients, this schedule is problematic. We're probably not going to have equipment. We're probably not, not going to have space for this. That will allow shippers like ourselves to cascade again down the routing guide proactively weeks, sometimes months in, in advance, update our delivery cost of goods sold accordingly um, and, and stay solvent. We're all partners and we need to ensure that all parties involved are, are profitable, successful and efficient. I mean, shippers will complain about spiking freight rates this year. And, and yes, it is a, a, a problem, certainly. Um, it's not an easy thing to, to pay $20,000 for, for ocean freight. That being said, if this is what's required for carriers to stay profitable and run services with adequate capacity, not just for this year, but I'm thinking long term, three years, five years, 10 years, then so be it. Um, but uh, we all need to be equally invested than that. So if shippers are invested in carrier's profitability, then that needs to be a two-way street as well. Finally, visibility of carrier constraints. Again, um, that's referring to capacity uh, or equipment constraints, transshipment delays, et cetera, et cetera. 
would be helpful um, in a technology platform, <clears throat> excuse me, platform to allow shippers to, to again, um, plan proactively. And finally, there's some questions that we should probably review at some point. Where is the breakdown between carrier tracking data and reality? You know, where, what's causing uh, our, our vessel has arrived at berth when they're anchored uh, in the Long Beach Harbor uh, for 10 days, 14 days? Should box rules be eliminated to free up chassis and make that a more egalitarian um, uh, approach, re removing market constraints? And can we achieve data standardization, uh, as we've discussed here, if participation in provided solutions is elective and not mandated? And finally, can we get all parties involved in trade approved to clear emerges? Uh, a little bit of a pet project of mine, um, but uh, a final point here that I wanted to make. So I'm going to stop sharing here, I think. Uh, hey, thank, uh, thanks, uh, Brian. Thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, the uh, uh, if you could uh, make your uh, PowerPoint available to our staff, uh, we're going to collect all the information. And uh, you had a lot of good uh, suggestions there, uh, topics that we're looking at. Uh, Commissioner Dye is looking at the ERD uh, uh, data requirements and and how to do that more effectively. So uh, and uh, a lot of good uh, questions uh, that need to be answered. Um, and and, uh, and we look forward to working with you uh, further uh, on those questions and, and determining whether or not we can come up with a better uh, mousetrap on uh, information. And, and that leads right to my next person uh, who we're going to be asking uh, to uh, settle some of these questions. Uh, 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 Dr. Monaco uh, is our director of uh, trade and analysis. Uh, we've we recently went out to uh, Utah to meet with a, a company, a shipping company that had a very uh, good technology platform and has, has addressed a lot of these issues. Uh, and and that was the the possible and uh, and the, the challenges the industry is so uh, immense. And and I think uh, John, you've you've seen that as you go on. How many actors are involved in a in a uh, in a particular movement of cargo is truly stunning. And they all like a a ballet uh, with lots of ballerinas being thrown up in the air, and right now we're missing. And uh, there's a huge uh, pileup of, of uh, ballerinas on the stage, and so uh, we need to, to 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 do better in this area. So, uh, uh, Dr. Monaco is, is spearheading our initiative, and uh, she's got a, a PowerPoint, and and she'll provide an explanation of uh, some of the things that we'd uh, like to do moving forward uh, with the industry. And so. Uh, Kristen. Thank you, sir. Can you see my slides? Yep. Perfect. Thank you so much for letting me be involved in today's presentation. So as was mentioned in my bio, prior to coming to FMC, I work for a federal statistical agency. So I'm really coming at this project from the perspective of someone who thinks about the success that data-oriented agencies have had in efficient data structures and data sharing. So you've heard from prior presenters about a lot of these issues and limitations and obstacles that need to be overcome, but there's a lot of entities in the federal government who've already thought through some of this and how can we bring that information to the maritime data realm. Um, primarily here, I'm thinking about their processes and best practices designed to make it easy to use their data and integrate this with data from other agencies. Statistical agencies accomplish their goals by having well-defined lexicons, terms that are used consistently across agencies and taxonomies or classification systems. And I think pretty much every speaker who came before me today mentioned this in various ways, right? Consistent definitions, harmonization, data aligning with each other. These types of systems are obviously largely absent from the maritime data environment. And so Brian gave an example of this. I'll give another example of this. In my office, oftentimes we get telephone or email inquiries from stakeholders about terminology. And so they'll ask who's considered a shipper versus a consignee under a particular scenario. The issue obviously is that the definitions that FMC uses are not always used and understood the same way by industry. This raises problems when we use different terms to refer to the same thing, but it's actually even worse when we're calling something by the same term, but different players, different stakeholders have different understandings and underlying definitions. 
Taxonomy is also incredibly important. In the federal government, industry is classified using the North American Industrial Classification System, which moves your industry codes from general to more detailed in a very structured way that follows clear definitions. So for example, if I want to know something about trucking, I can go to NAICS 484121, which is General Freight Trucking Long Distance Truckload. However, if I have the six digit code and I go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics or Census or the Bureau of Economic Analysis or the Bureau of Trade Statistics, and I use the same code, I can match data on this code because I know all of these agencies are using the same classification system with the same underlying definitions. This also holds for geography and other things that are held standard across these agencies, but is not applied consistently in maritime data. Finally, it matters how people are able to access the data. Even when maritime information is available, as you've heard earlier today, often there's some sort of manual or not quite automated process for obtaining it, which leads to a lot of inefficiency and ultimately some parties not even leveraging the data that might be available. So let's look at a really basic example of problems that we run across with taxonomy and lexicon that probably shouldn't occur. And so in this example, let's say I just want to match CBP data on vessel entries with detailed peers data on vessel characteristics. So this should be relatively straightforward. You would imagine that I could take a spreadsheet from the CBP and match it to a spreadsheet from peers because both of them are using data from the same underlying source. And so it should seem straightforward, but it's really not. Both of these data sets use different terms for certain fields. So for example, CBP calls it port filing port name and peers calls it US port. The ports themselves are called slightly different things. CBP adds state in the record, peers does not. And for small ports, they use slightly different names entirely. If I want to match on a vessel, in this case, I'm looking at a vessel named Yogi. I can see that directly in peers, but there's other text in that field in the CBP record, so I can't just directly match them. And while they use the same two digit code for foreign country happily, they call them different things, right? In CBP, it's called last foreign country and peers has a code associated with it. So all of these issues are surmountable, right? I can figure out how to work through this example and fix it, but the more data you start to try to string together, the more insurmountable this problem becomes because we have a lot of different systems, a lot of different players. It increases the number of idiosyncrasies that you have to reconcile and it becomes incredibly cumbersome. So let's turn to data transmission and Brian touched on this really nicely as well. I'm going to again start with an example from the federal government. So on Friday, last Friday, the employment situation was released by BLS, right? This is this monthly report that has information on unemployment and um, payroll numbers. And I want to take these data and compile a report for the FMC. And so to do this, I can use the BLS data tools and you see those sort of laid out at the top of the slide. The least efficient thing would be for me to say, go to the BLS press release, look through the PDF, find the table I want, take the number, transcribe it, put it in an Excel file and use it. More efficient would be to use one of their data extract tools. So I can use their one screen tool, it's the green icon there, and it will prompt me through a bunch of questions to help me locate the series I want. It'll ask me about data formatting, et cetera, and I can download an Excel file. If I already know my series ID, I can use a different tool called the series report, enter the series in, I'll be prompted for a bunch of data formatting questions. Again, download an Excel file. All of these processes require me to go out to their website and replicate this action again and again. It's not particularly efficient. Or I can write, I can use an API package and write a little code, in this case an R, and this code will hit the BLS database, grab the series I want for the years that I want, clean them up a little bit and output them to an Excel file or anything else I want. And so in my case, using an API saves me about 15 minutes a month. So that's not very much. 
But let's take this example over to LMCs or shippers, parties who are accessing web portals again and again to access their data, right? They're doing millions and millions of these actions. They're incredibly repetitive and they're potentially relatively easily automated, but it raises the question, who is going to take the responsibility for creating these automated platforms and do they have an incentive to do it by themselves? So turning specifically to maritime data generation, transmission and use, this is an overly simple schematic and I wish I had Brian's in advance because his were better and they're really good hypotheticals, but this is a really general illustration that shows a really basic import process. And obviously change the order around and it holds for exports as well. But at each stage from the bill of lading all the way to the final delivery of the good, you have each party who's responsible for their particular action, who takes some key data elements from earlier in the chain, transforms the data a little bit, adds in their new data and transmits it to some parties further down the chain. And in order for this to work well for the maritime data system, first we need an efficient process. So for example, truckers should not be searching through multiple websites daily to try to figure out what's happening at each terminal within a port complex. It's not efficient. It should be transparent and visible. So the BCO and parties downstream in the chain should know where the freight is. There shouldn't be black boxes where key stakeholders are losing sight of cargo in the chain. We need an accessible process, which is to say, for example, most drayage companies don't have the resources to create their own IT systems to try to automate all of these cumbersome processes. They're transportation service providers. They're not application development specialists, right? They're not structured for this. And finally, the data need to be complete. So if there are changes to data elements, that should be retained in the records, not overwritten by new data that doesn't preserve the history of various transactions. And Brian touched on this with his reference to blockchain, right? So if you have an understanding at 8 a.m. about what type of equipment and what type of transactions are allowed at a terminal and that information changes at noon, the records should still contain the information about the status earlier in the day, right? It makes the information preserved and much more transparent for everyone to understand. And we shouldn't need to patch together all these different parts from many different data sources. Records should be portable, and I think this was touched upon by Lars and Brian as well. So where are we going with this? What are the next steps for the group? As Commissioner Bensel said, the next step are these listening sessions with the different segments of the supply chain starting next week. And the types of information we really want to understand are what data are being used that are critical to operations, but importantly, what are the data gaps, right? What do you have? What do you need? How is data transmitted in practice? And how could it be transmitted to better make use of it? And what obstacles generally exist in accessing data? We'll have follow-up meetings to ensure complete understanding. And as Commissioner Bensel mentioned, there will be a data summit in the spring to present initial findings, including recommendations and identified best practices. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kristen. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, clearly you've been thinking a lot about how we need to proceed and you're uh, taking the lead uh, on this. And uh, and I really am excited that we uh, we have an expert. Uh, uh, I had to, well, in Utah, she explained to me the difference between EDI and API. So I can't claim to have any particular expertise in this, uh, uh, but but it's, uh, it's uh, it's an issue that plays out every day operationally with all of the companies that are involved. And so if, if we don't do anything uh, uh, to come to a better uh, system of harmonization in this area, uh, we're going to be in trouble in the future uh, because uh, 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 Lars uh, was uh, unable here to drop off uh, because of requirements, but I was at a presentation that he made and he was indicating um, that the world uh, intermodal uh, transportation 
uh, system uh, transported 1% more cargo uh, this year than last year, which isn't a big increase. However, in the United States, uh, our staff reported uh, just uh, to the commissioners just recently that the ports of LA and Long Beach, uh, and since the pandemic, have uh, registered increases of 26% on LA and 21.5% in, in Long Beach over this time. And uh, the estimate that Lars had was that as a result of congestion that we uh, to the entire world's uh, 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 fleet is uh, we've lost uh, uh, approximately over 13% of the total capacity to move cargo. So you extrapolate what that means to the United States. Uh, you're looking at a nation that, that could have uh, lost 20% uh, percent of their capacity because of congestion related uh, delays and, uh, and uh, is suffering increases, suffering. It's good that we're having increases of cargo. Uh, it's good for business, but, uh, but we're, we're dealing with a, a combination of increases of cargo uh, and, and congestion, and, and that's the challenge that, that we're facing. Um, but, uh, but I did want to say we have a, a website that we're making available, maritime data at fmc.gov. Uh, so uh, that's where uh, you can send communications directly uh, to, to the FMC. And I, I don't really have any questions myself, but I want to recognize my colleagues uh, uh, who are working on, on various uh, elements that we talked about today as well. Uh, so I think Commissioner Dye, you're, you're up uh, uh, first. And if you had any questions uh, of the uh, uh, panelists, uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you. I, I don't have questions, um, but I, I appreciate all of the comments and they're all familiar to us. Um, uh, Brian, uh, uh, your, um, um, I think we need more supply chain mapping, honestly. Um, so um, uh, often our shippers turn right to go left. And uh, information would, um, would uh, well, let me say, if, if I say information again, you can stop me and correct me knowledge. If you have particular pieces of things that you have to know, then um, all shippers will find it easier to do business and carriers will profit as well, I'm convinced. So uh, together, um, I, I think this is extremely worthwhile and I appreciate it. And I'll be calling you up, Brian. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And Thank to your you. point, uh, I Thank like your analogy of shippers turning left to, to go right. In some cases, it's not a conscious decision that we're making. Um, it's a reaction to something that's been put in front of us. And, you know, I don't want to throw any of the other parties involved in logistics under the bus. You know, I think carriers, ports and terminals, shippers, drainage providers, customs brokers, we're all somewhat, you know, suffering from the same disease of reactiveness uh, because the data is so fragmented and we're all developing certain pieces of data. Okay. The data uh, the macro data overall, but it's not being shared in a cohesive manner. So carriers are being just as reactive in, you know, in, in, in yes. their world that as we so are. That is so true. That is so true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Uh, does yes. uh, Commissioner Corey, uh, anything you want to add? Mike, uh, uh, I think he said he'd be on, on mute. So uh, if, if he does, well, he'll get back to us. And Commissioner Sola, I think is uh, is probably also in that position, but uh, I'll give you a call out and if if you want to uh, say something. Okay, okay, uh, and I think Dan, you're okay. I think is that me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, uh, I, I think this set the right exactly the right tone for the for the first meeting, uh, and uh, you know very much appreciate. Uh, the people who came and spoke, and, and in the case of uh, uh, Mr. Bakari um, uh, um, and uh, Mr. Uh, Bumpus, to staying for the whole whole thing, and of course uh, Dr. Monaco, but she doesn't have a choice. 
<laughs> well, uh, we, yeah, we we still appreciate it. Uh, so, uh, uh, but uh, John, uh, we'll uh, we'll be back in touch. We'll we'll coordinate with you. Uh, uh, the chairman asks that we uh, uh, stay in close comment uh, uh, contact going forward uh, and to uh, uh, coordinate actions and uh, and looking forward. Mike, did you uh, want to add anything? Uh, I saw no, on there. I just wanted to. Uh, uh, thank John uh, Picari for taking time and uh, thank every all the participants and uh, this is really a very very worthwhile uh, effort and hopefully we'll uh, we'll get to some good fruit that Commissioner died not in her head so thanks all thanks and this is gonna be first to many thanks again I, th thank I think all. that's th that about sums it up we appreciate uh, all of the presenters uh, uh, and uh, and uh, we'll be uh, moving forward uh, and look forward to the next meeting. Great. Thank you. Take care. Good day. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye.